for the victory. Thank God for the victory that comes to us through Jesus Christ. Thank God for the victory. Ha, 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 ha. Hey, shit. Ha, ha, ha. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Y'all just a little bit too passive. Come on, we're talking about our very existence. It's all because of Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, we thank God for his goodness in our lives. We thank God for that beautiful melody from heaven that he gave to Pastor McDowell. Our first time hearing it in this edifice. Amen. Somebody say it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. So we praise God for that. So befitting for the season that we're in. Amen. We're taking time this uh, month of reflection as we come into resurrection celebration on next Sunday. And so we designated this as time to be reflective of the goodness of God and what he did for us when he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Sometimes we get a little passive about that and we forget. But the reason why we have Memorial Day is because we want to remember, right? We want to remember this 365, 66 days a year, but even more so in the midst of this celebration as we reflect on what Jesus did on Calvary and all that he went through to get there. We want to become sensitized. Glory. <laughs> Shut up. 
If you become insensitized, oh yeah, glory, glory, glory. Your hands go up. Might even have a little quiver in them, glory. Because he's been so good. He had suffered persecution, endured many things just for you and for me. Father loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son. <laughs> oh, it's a celebration, y'all. If you have a revelation of what this means to us, it's a celebration. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're on. Hallelujah. If you can just give us a little more volume. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of gathering around your word and reflecting on you and your goodness in our lives. Wonderful things that you've done on our behalf. We especially delight to celebrate and to reflect on what Jesus did when he came into the earth for us. And we thank you that we're inspired by his deeds and his acts. And we thank you, Father, that we'll continue, therefore, in that to bring you all the glory, bring you all the honor, because Jesus paved the way for us to be able to do it. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, I um, thank God for the opportunity to be able to stand before you once again and thank God for Pastor McDowell willing to give me this privilege. I don't take it lightly. We have been having conversation around how critically important it was for saints to really get grasp the essence of the goodness of God in our lives and what he did in sending Jesus Christ. And then to find inspiration for your uh, continuing in the works that Jesus began. And so uh, today, uh, we, we, you know, last week we had a chance to talk about, um, we talked about how Jesus was pre Existent, He was before time because Jesus was part of the Trinity and he was in on creation uh, uh, in the beginning. And Jesus was, uh, it was prophesied, I said to you, about 38 times in Old Testament scripture um, about what Jesus would do or some encounter that would happen while he was in the earth. And that uh, we saw also, I can't, I couldn't, had, didn't, don't have time and didn't have time to take you to every account, but I could show you and take you to places in the New Testament where there were 38 accounts of Jesus fulfilling that those, those assignments or showing up in those spaces and places as it was said and doing what it was said that he would do um, in the Old Testament. So we celebrate that. Not anything to be taken lightly and be passive about, because that means that God is a God of a master plan. Right, come on now. That means that that God is one who has, he has, uh, he had, has a master plan uh, for everything. Just like when he decided to recreate the earth, he called it the way he wanted it to be, right? He had a master plan. Yeah. And then he, he said to uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, let's make man in our likeness and image, put him in the earth and let him have dominion and authority in the earth and operate as my agents there, right? And so they got an agreement and God did all that he did and created man and brought forth Eve. And so when he did that, we looked at how he gave some directives for how they were to govern themselves in the garden. And then um, it uh, turns out that Adam and Eve um, both decided to defy God's order. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then... Uh, God shows up in the garden. Now he's like, where are you? They're hiding. 
for the first time. Now they've been naked all this time, you know, and they, and they, it was no issue because they were it was it was they were in a, the presence of God and what they saw different about each other they saw it as good because God created that way and they didn't see any harm in it but when the sin entered in what came guilt yes. condemnation yes. they fear they begin to hide so it changed their trajectory and at that point God spoke the uh, spoke some things to them and said that there would be some curses that would come forth as a result of the sin. But when Genesis, the third chapter, the 15th verse, that's where he said, and uh, to the, he, he said to the serpent that his seed was going to bruise his head and he would bruise his heel. Right. Okay. So now, um, so each prophecy was fulfilled according as it was written uh, in the word of God, in the word of God in the Old Testament, but that was God's per first thing time that he dispensed this information that he had a plan of redemption and that Jesus was that plan. And so, so when we go and we look at the life of Jesus Christ, note that there were two branches in the stream um, of the Masiatic prophecy. There were two streams. One stream was that he would reign Messiah, the kingly, as the kingly Messiah. And then the other was the prophecy of the suffering of a Messiah. So Jesus, even though he was king and he would reign as king, he would suffer through some things as the Messiah. And so um, just, just when you start thinking about, um, so when circumstances, some circumstances seem to present in your life, and you don't, you can't quite figure out how that ended up happening that way because you've really been trying to live to glorify God with your life. Amen. Uh, and, and so recognize that sometimes suffering comes with this journey. Amen. Sometimes suffering comes with this journey, but it, I, I realize in the moments and the seasons of life that I suffered, it was part of the making. Yeah. See how you go through it will determine how you come out of it. Amen. So if you decide that you are going, if you decide, God, I'm in this, all of this, this opposition is coming against me, but I know that the Bible says, when you on my side, who can be against me? Amen. And that I'm going to be victorious. I'm going to win and I can, I can survive this because you are with me everywhere I go and you're with me in every situation. Amen. Amen. So um, these accounts in the Bible, those 38 accounts, help us to serve and serves as evidence that to know that God is sovereign. And God is sovereign. He is meaning from a political uh, concept that, that refers to dominant power or supreme authority. As it pertains to God, it says his absolute right in ruling to do all things according to his own good pleasure. So God is sovereign and he can do what he wants, when he wants to, how he wants to do it. So there were some things that God called for and there those things that he called for is he established as his will and his purpose and his plan. And um, all he needs is for us to recognize him to be sovereign and embrace it. Amen. All right. So he is the God of a master plan. We read over in Psalms uh, 37 uh, last week uh, how the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. So even God orders steps for Jesus. He orders steps for us. All right. And so uh, his plan is de depicted by the steps that he orders and reveals. And so uh, uh, his plan uh, for all his children, beginning with Jesus, comes, um, evolves the, 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 the outline, the forecast that he has for you, the direction that he wants you to go comes when he reveals his plan to you or when he's able to reveal his plan to you. And I think that's critically important to think about too. It's when he's able to reveal it to you. If you don't want to know it, he can be doing all this. Hey, you. 
You know how <laughs> you're talking to them. So if you don't want to know, then it's not his fault because I guarantee you he's trying to reveal it. So in Isaiah 46, the ninth chapter, the 13th verse, uh, you all could probably quote it, but I'll just read it real quickly. Isaiah 46, and I need to make sure I'm hearing up because I want to share with you all some specific things about Jesus' encounter. 46, um, the ninth through the uh, 13th verse, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, say my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executed my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. So he says, hearken unto me, ye stout hearted that are far from the righteous. And he's, he's talking to the children of Israel direct, directly. And he says, I bring near my righteousness. I, it shall not be cut far off and my salvation shall not tarry. And I will please, I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. So he was speaking these words relative to the children of Israel, but he's a God, God, he still operates the same way. You all know that he, he declares the, be, the, the end from the beginning to get you stimulated, to get you motivated. Uh, but then he wants you to check in with him on the steps to how to arrive. Amen. So he said in Isaiah 48, third, three through seven, have I spoken it? I will also bring it to pass. Have I pers purposed it? I will also do it. So if God is saying some things about us, just like he said things about Jesus, uh, we ought to be endeavoring to, to know what they are so that we can land in the right place at the right time. So the essence of me sharing my testimony last week was really to help you to see that God still moves in, in this way. And in modern day times, he's still speaking. He's still God. He's still speaking. And you ought to be here better than some of the others because he's living on the inside of you. And the Holy Spirit has the ability um, to reveal to us the truth about what he's saying about us. And so I shared the story because I, I wanted you to recognize how critically important it was for me to hear, really get what God was saying. He started saying something to me and I, I needed more clarity and I kept praying and I kept asking and praying because I wanted to know better. I wanted to know for certain because it was a critical move and how, how, how the window of opportunity only presented when it presented and so God wants us to be able to be just that precise so that he can move, he can advance you into what he has for you and he can be glorified in it. But, but these other things, these other prerequisites need to be in place so it can happen. So the, the witness, the witness of Jesus and how he operated and moved when he was in the earth, I think is significantly important for us to take a look at. So um, let's look at, if you will, go with me to uh, Matthew. Matthew, and I'm going to pick up at the, the fourth chapter. All right, the fourth chapter, um, and uh, picking up at the first verse. It says, then was Jesus led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him and said, if thou be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, my man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then uh, the devil taketh him up into the holy city and sitteth, uh, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down for it is written, 
he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And, and, and Jesus said unto him, Is it written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God? And the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee behind, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaves, leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So the angels came and ministered unto Jesus as he en endured this encounter um, with the enemy. So Jesus had showed up on the scene to be baptized. John the Baptist um, had been speaking of the one who was to come when he came. And he, John said he, his feet, he was not worthy to, to take the latchets off his shoe. Um, but but, uh, uh, but uh, Jesus said, because it is, it is written according to the scripture, do as it was said and baptize me. All right? So that was an encounter that had been uh, prophesied in Old Testament and now is playing out in the New Testament. And then when he baptized him, um, John's eyes were opened and he saw the dove of the Holy Spirit come to rest upon him. Right? And so then he said, for sure this is the Messiah the son of the living God, because the Lord had told him when he, when the one who he would see the dove descending upon, that was the one, right? All right. So what do we learn here is, from here is that Mark, um, that uh, Jesus was immediately led into the wilderness to go and fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And um, Jesus also was there to he was there to spend time with God and to be getting ready for the release of him stepping into his ministry. Um, but he also was led there to be tempted of the devil. So now there was some some suffering that came as a result of just doing the fast and buffeting the flesh. But then the enemy came to try to sift him and um, trip him up so that he wouldn't complete his assignment. And so the, as it goes, Satan having been cast out of heaven by the Lord when he sinned against God in heaven, Satan fully is, has, Satan's full fury has ever since been turned against God and his work. During Jesus' incarnation, that wrath was specifically focused in all its intensity against the son and against his divine mission of salvation. The devil's single purpose is to frustrate the plan of God and to usurp the place of God. Yeah. And so, so he wants to mess up, interrupt the plans that God has, and he wants to act like he's got power and an authority over him. It's like he didn't get the message when he got kicked out of heaven. I mean, he, he convinced a third of the heavenly hosts. I guess he felt like he was successful to some degree. So now, um, why, why change up your, his game? He wants to sift us. He wants to keep us from coming in with the, what God has planned for us. He therefore continually attacks Christ and all who belong to him. He also per pursues every effort to keep others from coming to Christ. Okay, so we, we, we want to know that what he was doing to Jesus, according to this is, this, is the same that he would be doing to us. I mean, really, if he was willing to do that to Jesus, the son of the living God, what makes us think he, he won't, he won't try us. <laughs> so what we should know is that God, God never tests in the sense of enticing to evil. 
Let no one say, this is what the scripture says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed in his own lust. That's what the scripture says. So now all five of the forms of to tempt in those verses are uh, indication of the negative side of testing and the inducement to evil. But God never has a part in this sort of testing. But he can and will turn even the worst sort of testing into the right sort. So when it is surrendered to his will and power, it is God's great desire to turn into victory what Satan intends for failure. To strengthen us at the very point where the adversary wants to find us weak. Somebody need to say, I'm not going to let him find me weak. <laughs> You know he's coming for you. Amen. Amen. The minute you make a decision that I'm going to do what God wants me to do, I'm going hard for God. Amen. I love him with all my heart. Amen. And I'm going to give him all of me. And the first assignment he gives you, and you get a little success, you get excited. And then the enemy comes to try to, try to, uh, you know, take your zeal away and your confidence away. We don't want to let him have that space. All right. So Jesus was tempted. The first temptation in the wilderness implied essentially the same mocking taunt that the crowds made at the crucifixion. So the first thing, the first thing, uh, that, uh, uh, Lucifer said to him, let me go back to, the first one. Uh, I didn't turn my page and lost my place. Somebody tell me what was the first temptation. Turn, this, turn, in this, turn those stones to bread because you know you're hungry, boy. <laughs> right? Yeah. And um, uh, so he said the same mocking taunt that the crowds made at the crucifixion. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. That was the same kind of mocking. You, you, you know, if you, you the son of God, you, you, could, you got the ability to turn this bread, these stones to bread and have a feast. But Jesus loving God and honoring the father and, and knowing that he had been sent into the wilderness to, to fast 40 days and 40 nights and to spend time with the father, consecrating himself unto his, new, unto his assignment. So it was the absolute trust and submission that Satan sought to shatter. I have, I, to, to have uh, succeeded would have put an, an, an irreparable rift in the Trinity. Wow. If he had had success in that moment, there would have been a rift in the Trinity of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There would no longer have been three in one, no longer have been of one mind and purpose. And so uh, Jesus came at him with the word and he says, it is written, man shall not live by bread, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I'm here to tell you that your success comes when you're in the book, you know what the book says, you understand what the book says, and you use it. Just by the example that Jesus did right here, he spoke it, and he shut the devil up. So he's like, I can't get him on that one. Mm. Come on. So then he goes and he, he comes uh, he and so then he talks about uh, he will give his angels charge over you. Well, let me go. Then the devil took him up to the holy city um, and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Just go and do it. 
for it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest they strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord, your God to test. So now, so he gets clever. Jesus, the first temptation, Jesus comes at him with the word. So now he comes to this second temptation and he says, he quotes the word. He's a deceiver. He's crafty, the scripture says. Okay, so he quotes the word. But then Jesus, Jesus resists him. And he, he tells him uh, that you don't tempt the Lord. You don't test him that kind of way. That's a misappropriation of the use of God's word. It's kind of like the people that start, uh, when they say we can tread on serpents and scorpions, and they started a religion around dancing on serpents. We've had, a, we've had reports. Because they were tempting the Lord. It was inappropriate. So uh, some came to demise. And so he says, he will give his angels charge over you and on their hands will bear you up lest ye strike your foot against a stone. Truly God could have sent, would have sent angels. God did make this promise in his word, but Jesus lived only by the word of God. Then he would be, um, uh, he would uh, be confronted by something from the word of God. You claim to be God's son and you claim to trust his word, Satan was saying. If so, why don't you demonstrate your sonship and prove the truth of God's word by putting him to a test, a scriptural test? And if you won't use your own divine power to help yourself, let the father use his. His divine power to help you. If you won't act independently of the father, let the father act. Give the father a chance to fulfill the scripture. I just quoted you. <laughs> that, that was his mindset. So uh, you have to know how to put the enemy in his place. So Jesus did it by what? Quoting the word with understanding. Not just saying the words, but quoting it with understanding. That's critically important for us. So um, Jesus was not willing to participate. So I'm picking my pace here. So then the last one was, he said, uh, he, t he took him, uh, he took him to, the, in the verse eight, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said unto him, all these things will I give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I, well, you know, technically, he, 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 um, he, was, he is the God of this world, right? That's what the scripture says, that when Adam sinned in the garden, he gave him that authority to be the God of this world. The thing about it is, Satan knows that that's only a temporal situation. He, he knew that he, he knows that that's only a temporal situation and the, the, the beginning of the end starts with Jesus coming into the world and then completing his work on Calvary and then going to the grave and coming up with all authority and power. And so, 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 uh, Jesus does just, just, he just shut him down and told him what be gone. Get back, Satan. Y'all know how the old saints used to say. And what did he do? What did Satan do? He left. He left. Yes, and pastor said he left for a season. That's right. He will come. If you are victorious, he going to come back and try to come another angle or come another way. And, and, and if you find a way, an angle that seems to get, your, get you every time, that's the way he's going to keep coming. Do y'all do understand that? But if you know that who you have become because of all this that Jesus did and the power that's been invested in you, then you can take authority and tell him, get back, get out of my way. You are not going to deceive me. 
Because I know who I am. I know whose I am. I know the power that resonates in me. Amen. So, so, um, so Jesus, he's, he's, he's continuing on to do the work that God called him to do. And um, he experienced this, this temptation. But the one thing that Jesus said in St. John, the fifth chapter, the 30 verse, uh, part B, I just said, I'm just quoting part B. It says, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father, which have sent me, I'm going to complete. I'm going to complete. I'm going to complete. I'm going to finish. I'm going to walk it out. I'm going to do it. No matter how much, how uncomfortable it gets for me in my flesh, because I'm one with the Father, and my heart desires what he desires. So, uh, so now, uh, let's go to... Hmm. Matthew, the 14th chapter. So what am I saying to you? I, I read the example because I want you to know the authority and the power that Jesus operated in and that it's the, that's been given over to you. You could do the same. We're supposed to be inspired by his example, right? Have you ever had to use your authority? Well, amen. Y'all sitting there real quiet. But if you know that you had, you, you had, to, you know, you had to pull up some stuff, call on some scripture and declare it in the midst of adversity. I mean, smoke all around. You can't see with your natural eyes, but you know, through the eyes of the spirit that victory is yours. So in the 14th chapter, um, the 14th chapter. Jesus, the 10th verse. I'm going to read this real quick because I got, I, got, I got to hurry up. And as he sent, and he, and he sent and beheaded John in prison. So John the Baptist was put in prison and uh, Herod's um, daughter asked for the head of John the Baptist for as a birthday present. And so he, told, he gave her what she wanted. And as his head was brought in, in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of, out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was um, moved with compassion toward them and healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals." And uh, Jesus, but Jesus said unto them, they need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. I doubt that that's going to satisfy all these people. And he said, bring them hither. Bring them to me. Bring me the fish in the loaves. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to, uh, uh, to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. So they had more left over than what they started with. You need to see the supernatural showing up in a situation that, that was impossible. They couldn't serve those people. They couldn't feed them. But, but, but Jesus, and it says, and they had eaten, they, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. 5,000 men got served and the women and children. You know what's more than one child per family? And in that day, they might have had multiple wives. Yeah. So the supernatural showed up in that situation. But I want you to notice how when Jesus heard this message, this news about John the Baptist, you can't tell me that he didn't feel some emotions. 
He was, he was, he, even though he knew what was to come, it was just to know that this had happened to his cousin, the forerunner, the one who paved the way for him to come and people to receive him. And so it says that Jesus went away in a boat to the, to the other side. I suspect he needed some time to grieve and some time to gather himself. However, when the people knew he was there, they came out of the cities to him, right? And they come by the droves. Jesus like, I came here to spend some time and to be with my father and to deal with my emotions. But what happened instead, Jesus said, oh, no, you know what? I, 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 I'm good. I knew this was coming. Let me shake myself loose. Let me get it together because I'm going to minister. I'm going to hurt Satan right where it hurts the most. I'm going to deliver the message about me to them. And I'm going to minister to them and their needs so that they will leave here fully convinced that, that the God, my father, who sent me is the only God. He's the supernatural God, right? And that I am his son. And they'll believe on me. You know, something happens when you feed people. <laughs> They want to come back next Sunday. So he drew them in. But the, what's, what's the significance I want to make here is that Jesus, uh, he rose up above his circumstances and he had the wherewithal to continue in his, the assignment that God had on his life. And, and so um, that's important because a lot of times we as saints, what do we do when we have a challenge? When we have a disappointment, something that really broke us, got to, uh, got to the core of me. What do we do? Shut down and sulk is what somebody said. And who are we shutting down on? Uh-huh. But Jesus, our perfect example, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus shook himself loose. He got up and he kept, he said, I'm going to hit him where it hurts the most. I remember we lost our son, Justin. And um, uh, we had a visitor come to our home and she spoke to us to minister to us encouragement. And uh, she, you know, she came first, she came with a word of knowledge and, that, and, and uh, the word of knowledge that was, that needed, I needed to hear. She spoke it to me and she, it, she, it was accurate. It was precise. It was right on. And she said, I still sense the presence of the person in the room. And she spoke to what that situation was. So when she said that, because when she came in, I was crying. And I, I assumed she thought I was crying because I was weeping over Justin. But I really was weeping over an encounter. But the Lord revealed it. And then she said, you can let this be your mountain or you can make it your mohill and you can walk over it. And so that, that's, that's when Pastor and I decided, oh, no, the devil, you shouldn't have never messed with us. And so now he walking the streets downtown and everybody he can see, everybody he can talk to, you're going to get saved today. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. He could have sat down on God said no. But he started ministering to anybody and everybody who he could get a conversation with. People were getting filled with the Holy Spirit on the street. Hit them where it hurts. And we haven't stopped to this day. Glory to God. All right, so I'm saying that to you because you don't want to sit down on God um, in your distress. Um, make sure that when in your distress, your disappointment, your hurt, your pain and frustration, that you cast the care over the, to the Lord. He knows you aching. He knows. He understands. He knows you're in distress. But cast the care over to the Lord and let him care for you. Let him bring you comfort. So don't be weary and well-doing because you'll reap a harvest if you faint not. Yeah. So if you take a hit, just get up, fight back, hit him back. You know how, you, you know how you, um, uh, some of y'all parents used to say, if they hit you and you come home and you tell me they beat you up, you go, I'm going to give you a spanking, right? <laughs> so hit him where it hurts the most. Keep on doing the work of the kingdom and enlarging it. So I got a few minutes left and I want to share this with you because it's about the actual crucifixion of Jesus. Um, 
And so, I, 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 because I want us to get the picture. I'm not trying to gross anybody out today. I just want us to really get the image of the experience that Jesus went through for us. Okay, so in, uh, in the infinite psychic and spiritual suffering of the incarnate God in atonement for the sins of a fallen man, I have no competence to discuss. So this was written by uh, uh, Dr. Ta uh, Dr. Davis, who did an analysis and a study on what the experience really was like for Jesus. And he says, um, <clears throat> however, the physiological and anatomical aspects of our Lord's pa passion, we can examine in some detail. What did the body of Jesus um, what did the body of Jesus of Nazareth actually endure during those hours of torture? This led me first to study to the study of the practice of, of the crucifixion itself. I want y'all to see the, the let type the lettering. So if I'm stumbling, you just bear with me. I, did, I I'm trying to make this one contact work. Come on, get with the program. <laughs> <laughs> it's not wonderful. Okay. So um, he said, so th uh, the, that is the torture and the execution of a person by fixation to a cross. And apparently the, the first known practice of crucifixion um, was by uh, the Persians, but then it, it, the practice ended up uh, coming into the Roman, Roman culture. Okay. So... Now, the physical passion of Christ began in Gethsemane or in the, in the many aspects of the individual suffering. I shall only discuss one of the physiological interests, um, the bloody sweat. It is interpreting that the physician of the group it is, determined, it is interpreted that the physician of the group, St. Luke, because Luke was a doctor, is the only one to mention this in his writing, because he's a doctor. And he says, and being in agony, he prayed the longer, and his sweat became as drops of blood trickling down upon the ground. Every attempt... Uh, has been given, um, had been, give, been used by mockers, scholars, to explain away this phase, apparently under the mistaken impression that this just does, doesn't happen. So people didn't believe it was true, that it could happen. So uh, uh, he's saying that a great deal of effort could be saved by consulting with medical um, literature. So that's where he found this information. And he says that um, after the arrest in the middle of the night, Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin and the, uh, the council and the high priest. And it is here that the first physical trauma was inflicted. A soldier struck Jesus across the face from remaining silent when questioned by uh, Cephas. The, the place guards, the palace guards, then blindfolded him and mockingly taunted him to identify them as they each passed by. They spat on him and struck him in the face. In the early morning, Jesus battered and bruised dehydrated and exhausted from a sleepless night is taken across Jerusalem to uh, the fortress Antonia and the seat of the government of the pr prosecutor of Judea. And when he, he's taken there, Jesus suffer, is par apparently suffered no physical mistreatment at that time, at that location. But Many scholars believe that Pilate originally ordered Jesus scourged as his full punishment 
and that the death sentence by crucifixion came only in response to the taunt by the mob that the prosecutor, uh, the, the procurator, I'm sorry, was not properly defending Caesar against the peacemaker, the pretenders, I'm sorry, who claimed to be king of the Jews. So the uh, preparations for the scourging are carried out and the prisoner is stripped of his clothing and his hands tied, tied to a post above his head. It is doubtful whether the Romans made him attempt to follow the Jewish law in this matter of scourging. The Jews had an ancient law prohibiting more than 40 lashes. The Pharisees always making sure that the law was strictly kept insisted that only 39 lashes be given because they didn't want to make, they wanted to make sure they didn't cross 40 because then they would have been in or out of order. So the Romans, uh, they, they, they step forward and they begin and they put a, a crown on his head. And I'm sorry, the, Romans, the Roman soldier put this item in his hand, um, which was a flag room. And this is a sort of whip consisting of several heavy leather thrones and two small balls of lead attached near the end of each. So the heavy whip is brought down with full force against and again and again across Jesus' shoulder, back and legs. At first, the heavy thrones cut through the skin only. Then as the, the blows continued, they cut deeper into the subcutaneous tissues, producing first an oozing of blood from the uh, cal uh, uh, capillaries. I know that I used to say it when I sold the medicine. And veins of the skin, and finally spurting arterial bleeding from vessels in the underlying muscles. The small balls of lead first produce large deep bruises, which are broken open by subsequent blows. Finally, the skin of the back is hanging in a long ribbons and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn. Get that picture. Bleeding tissue just hanging. When it is determined by the, by the centurion in charge that the prisoner is near death, the beating is finally stopped. Half faint Jesus is then united, untied, I'm sorry, and allowed to slump to the stone pavement, wet with his own blood. The Roman soldiers see a great, see a great joke in this pro, uh, provincial Jew claiming to be the king. They throw a robe across his shoulders and place, it, uh, place a stick in his hand for a scepter. So they were mocking him like you king, so hold this scepter. They still needed, they still need a crown to make their travesty complete. A small bundle of flexible branches covered with long thorns, commonly used for firewood, are planted into the shape of a crown and this is pressured into his scalp. Again, there is bleeding and the scalp being one of the most vascular areas of the body. So there was a lot of bleeding. After mocking him and striking him across the face, the soldiers take the stick from his hand and strike him across the head 
driving the thorns deeper into his scalp. Finally, they tire of their sadistic sport and the robe is torn from his back. This had already become at, uh, this had already become adherent. So now the, the, he was bleeding. Remember, they tore his, the skin of his back and it's just tissue. They put this robe on him and now they rip it from him. But it had become attached to his back. It had become attached to the blood clots that were there. Woo. And the serum in the wounds. And, it, and its removal passed as in the careless removal of a surgical bandage um, that causes excruciating pain. Anybody ever, they, you, went to the, you had something happen, they put surgical bandage on, and then they said, time to take it off, and they go, rip. And you wanted to slap them? I know. Why didn't you? No. <laughs> uh, so almost as though he were again being whipped and the wounds again being beginning to bleed. So he was experiencing it over again. In this um, indifference to Jewish custom, the Romans returned his garments. The heavy, um, they gave him the garments and then he went down along the road of Via Dolorosa on his way. And in spite of his efforts to walk erect, the weight of the heavy wooden uh, beam, because they had to carry their own cross, together with the, the shock produced by the, the blood loss, is too much. He stumbles and falls. The rough wood of the beam gouges into the lacerated skin and muscles of the shoulder. Because he's carrying it. Now see him. You're going to see a depiction. You're going to hear a little bit more about it next week, but he's carrying it on his shoulder. The rough, and, and so um, he couldn't endure it. So the centurion, ain't, um, anxious to get on with the crucifixion, selects a... Uh, person who's an onlooker, a North African onlooker named Simon Osiri to carry the cross. And Jesus, fo Jesus follows, still bleeding and sweating the cold, clammy sweat, bleeding from his shock that started in the garden. And he went 650 yards on the journey. And then uh, they... When the journey was completed, then they again stripped him of his clothes. Ugh. The crucifixion begins. Jesus is offered wine mixed with myrrh and a um, mild, like, an, like to serve as an, um, an analgesic to help with pain. But Jesus refuses to drink it. And Simon is ordered to place um, the cross on the ground. And then they threw Jesus on top of the cross backwards and his shoulders against the wood. Remember, his back is ripped. So they throw him on this, 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 this uh, cross with his bare back. And the legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of the wrist. So now when they say they nailed him in his hands, they pierced him in his hands, actually it was right here. Because if it had been in his hands, it wouldn't have been able to carry the weight. It was right here. Um, and then they put the, they put the, the sign on his uh, cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And they nailed that in place. So they put the left foot, they pressed it backwards against the right foot. And with both feet extended, toes down, a nail is driven through the arch of each. You stub your toe and you want Jesus to come, right? Oh my God. They put it through the two arches, the arch, the two uh, feet stacked on each other and it went through the arch of the feet, uh, leaving the knees moderately flexed. The victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down, with more weight on the nails 
in the wrist. Excruciating, fury pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. He feels that pain all the way up in his brain. The nails in the wrist are putting pressure on the median nerves. As he pushes himself upward to avoid this stretching torment, he tries to, to, to position himself a little better. He places his full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, there is scarring agony of the nail tearing through the nerves between uh, the bones of the feet. And at this point, another phenomenon occurs. As the arms fatigue, great waves of cramps sweep over the muscles, knotting them in, in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes inability to push himself upward anymore. Hanging by his arms, the pictorial muscles are paralyzed and the intercoastal muscles are unable to act. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but cannot be exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get even a short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream and the cramps partially subside. So he, has, he has some spasms and he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in life-giving oxygen. It, is, it was undoubtedly during this period that he uttered the seven short sentences which are recorded. Y'all know them. The first was, the first, as he looked down at the Roman soldiers throwing dices for his um, garment, he said, Father... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. How many of us would have been saying forgive? We say get. Them. But Jesus knew the plan. The the second to the uh, to the uh, cheat to the thief today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Uh, so um, and then the third looking down at the uh, ter ter terrified grief stricken. Adolescent John, the beloved apostle, um, he said, Behold thy mother, and looking to Mary, his mother, woman, behold thy son. The fourth cry is from the beginning of the is, is from the beginning of the 22nd Psalm. So this is an account in the Old Testament that happened in the New. The fourth cry came from that book, the 22nd book of Psalms, My God, my God. Why wow, have thou forsaken me? Hours of this limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint, rending cramps, intermittent partial of fixation, uh, searing, searing pain as tissue is torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down against the, the rough cross, the timber. Ugh. You get a little prick. You want to go to the hospital. Yeah. And as this is happening, the chest, in the chest, the, the uh, pericardium slows, uh, slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. So the heart is being overwhelmed with this, 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 lip, this, lip, this uh, serum. Let us remember Again, that the 22nd Psalms, the 14th verse, I am, proud, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. It is now almost over. The loss of tissue fluid has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy thick, sluggish blood into the tissues. The tortured lungs are making a, a frantic effort to gasp in small gulps of air. Then markedly dehydrated tissues send their, flo their flood of stimuli to the brain. 
So they're, they're communicating to the brain, I'm in distress. And Jesus cries out the fifth cry, I thirst. Let us remember another verse from um, the 22nd book of Psalm. My strength is dried up like a pot shear, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, dehydrated. And thou have brought me into the dust of death. So it was, ta- it was told how it would be. A sponge soaked um, in, pos- in posca, posca, the cheap sour wine, which is the staple drink for the Roman legionnaires, is lifted to his lips. He apparently doesn't take any of the liquid. The body of Jesus is now uh, in, in extremes, and he can feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. The realization brings about his sixth word, possibly li- a little more than a tortured whisper. It is finished. His mission of atonement had been completed. Finally, he can allow his body to die. With one last surge of strength, he once again presses his torn feet against the nail, straightens his legs, takes a deeper breath, because that's the only way he can get a breath, and utters the seventh and last cry. Father, into thy hands... I commit my spirit. And so you know the rest of the story. But this is what Jesus endured. Are y'all quiet because y'all in shock? It really is a time of rejoicing. Hmm. Because Jesus said, It's finished. What was finished? He completed his assignment here in the earth. And he endured this. Why? Why did he endure it? Oh, Lord. Are we talking to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's why we had to do this because we're too passive about it. That's why we had to teach it. Could have got up here and did a tune. He died. Yes, he did. But he did. Want you to think about it. what him, it cost him to deliver to you a new name, a new identity. (laughs) And finally put you in a position that you can do what he put Adam here to do in the first place. To walk in dominion, power, and authority. So now the scripture says that Jesus is seated at the right hand throne of the father. Well, don't don't let me skip all of this part because you know, Jesus went, now we talked about how you fight back, but Jesus went down into hell. It's what the scripture says. He that descended, ascended. But when he went down there, he he went down there to take care of some business. Do you understand that Jesus walked the earth as a mere man empowered by the Holy Ghost and he never sinned? Never. So was he eligible to go to hell? He was not eligible. He only became eligible when he took our stuff. And he's so loving, he took it before we ever did it. He's like, God is like, I'm making provision for you. Oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. And so he went into hell, and the Bible says he went down there, and he made an open show of the enemy. 
It's like we met, we, we, yeah, we met in the wilderness and we had a little tussle. But the Bible says he went down there and he kicked Satan's butt. He turned hell upside down. And he got up with all power and authority in his hands. He, first, he took back the keys to the kingdom. Why did he have to take them back? Because Adam gave them away. But over 2,000 2, years before that, Adam gave it away. But God said when it happened, this is what's going to happen. He had a master plan. He's got master plans for us. And then he went and he took his seat in heaven, seated at the right hand throne of the Father after he had appeared unto the disciples. He went and sat at the right hand throne of the Father. The Bible says he's sitting in a position of, of authority. And he's there making intercession for us. Come on, let, let lighten up on Jesus. Lighten up on Jesus. Don't let him have to keep going hard on you in prayer and intercession. Just get with the program. <laughs> Had he already done enough? No, apparently not because we need his intercession. Amen. But I'm, what I'm saying is he's done enough for you to walk in your believer's authority. He's done enough for you to take on the assignment that God has for your life. Because just like Jesus had one, you have one. It, it, it's not just, just Pat, me and Pastor McDowell. No, you got an assignment. It may not be in this pulpit, but there's a pulpit out there somewhere for you. And so, and then it says over in the Ephesians, the, it's the next verse chapter it says, and I believe that's the 21st verse, it says, uh, and we have been made to sit together with Christ Jesus. So if we're sitting together with him, there ought to be some oneness. Don't skip that part. Because Jesus came because he was one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. They, they were on one accord. So there should be, if we're sitting together with him, there ought to be some oneness some willingness to do what he's asking us to do. But then you also should know that he gave you the ability to do it. He sent the Holy Spirit to help you. And he gave you, he willed that authority and power over to you. So now just like you saw him, how you saw him handle the enemy. What you think you're supposed to do? But you got to do it by the same standard. Ooh. Glory. Glory to God. Glory. So I'm just, I'm just saying. When we come to Resurrection Sunday, all of this should be resonating in your heart and in your mind. Woo. And there ought to be some joy. There ought to be some rejoicing. Glory. There ought to be some rejoicing. There ought to be some repentance. Mm. I'm saying there ought to be some repentance in the room. Because, I, you know, I, I realized that uh, when, uh, when, G, when Jesus kept going, um, because he knew it was his assignment, he didn't quit. There's people in this room that have quit. You done backed up on God. And he said the gifts and callings come without repentance. If he, if he spoke to you about something, you know he has. And you draw it back. You drew back. This is a good time to get back on course. I don't know who you are, but you know. Don't let the suffering and the shedding of the blood go for naught. 
Amen. You know what was so supernatural about that situation with Jesus? After all of that, he didn't really die from the, from the crucifixion itself. What he died from was they were trying to check to see if he was dead. And so a soldier took a, a, a spear and stuck it up between his rib into his heart. And when they did that, then the rest of the blood and serum came out and he died. But the Bible says after all of that suffering, all that beating, where he was beaten so bad that you couldn't tell that he was disfigured so bad, you couldn't tell that he was a man or a woman. He did it for us all. Woo. But there was not one bone broken. Woo. Somebody said it reminded them of Elijah when, uh, um, when he said, can these bones live again? Victorious. He was victorious. He was victorious. He got his passageway in. He, he went in, did what he had to do, and came out. Victorious. Glory to God. I'm finished. But if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he did all of this just for you. He wanted you to have an opportunity to be a part of the family of God. He wanted you to have the promise of eternal life through salvation and the promise that you could live with him in eternity. This is an opportunity for you to come and to receive him as your Savior and Lord. The Bible says all you have to do is believe in your heart that he is the Son of God and confess with your mouth and you shall be saved. It's very simple. If you're here this morning and you want to come, come. If you're here this morning and you've gotten off the beaten path and some things have been out of order in your life, you know, just, just shame the devil. Come on in and confess and repent. Say, God, I missed you. Because he said in his word, if you are faithful, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you, of all, to cleanse you and forgive you of all unrighteousness. So it's nothing that you have done that this blood that he shed cannot be applied to. There's nothing. If you've gotten out of sync with him because you know that the call of God is on your life and there's things that he wants you to do and you kind of drew back, this is a good time to reestablish your relationship and jump right back in. If you're here and you, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is evidenced by speaking in tongues, please come forward. It's a gift that Jesus said that he would send back. The Father would send to help you to do everything that he did. Because the way he did it was he relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And, and, and then if you're here and God has been dealing with your heart about agape being the place where you should be a part of the ministry, we invite you to come down. I've given four invitations, salvation, rededication, baptism of the Holy Spirit, church membership. If you're here, come. If you're here this morning, come. If you're here this morning, come on. Come on, let Jesus know, ha ha, shout out, that it was worth it. Everybody standing on your feet. Saints praying. <laughs> To him who sits on the throne and unto the man. To him who sits on the throne and unto the man. Amen.
He's our master. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of gathering. We thank you that we took time to reflect on what this is all about. Had it not been for you, Father, had it not been for Jesus, there would be no church. And so we glorify you in this place and we thank you for the privilege of sonship. We thank you, Father, for the, 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 the supply that comes through the blood of Jesus. Health, wholeness, <laughs> shed to heart. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for peace, joy, salvation. We give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the promise of eternal life. We thank you for the authority of the believer. We thank you, Father God, for success. We declare that you have made us overcomers. Father, we glorify you. We declare that we are victorious through Jesus Christ. We're victorious through Jesus Christ. We declare we're victorious through Jesus Christ. We declare we're victorious through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. The lamb that was slain, the lamb that was slain for you and me. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. 
The joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah. blessings and glory and honor. Hallelujah. 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 All glory be to God. Hallelujah. Yes. Power in the name. Power in the name. Power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Come on, call his name. Call his name. Jesus. Jesus. Come on, call the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Call in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Victory in the name of Jesus. Victory in the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, how we love you. Jesus, how we love you. Jesus, how we adore you. Jesus, how we adore you. Jesus, hallelujah. Jesus, power in the name of 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 Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. 